we'll start. And uh, so I'm sharing this the, the screen. So hello to everybody. You will tell me when you can see my screen. Recording in. I can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, hello to everybody, and the, the, so we will talk uh, tonight um, about uh, remote spectroscopy, and so it means that we, we, you know that there is a lot of initiatives in uh, remote observing for years and years now, and, and there is a lot of people very experienced, but uh, there are only a few cases of uh, um, uh, remote observations in spectroscopy, and we, we would like to, to focus on the, that topic um, uh, tonight. And, uh, but of course, it's uh, important to uh, 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 use the, the experience of uh, the guys who already uh, uh, do uh, remote observations uh, in, um, in imaging, uh, because they have some experience and a lot of experience can be reused. And then the, the, um, we'll have some, some participants uh, to this meeting uh, that, that will talk about uh, imaging, remote imaging. Okay, the, the, and of course, uh, also uh, tonight, I would love uh, to, to take, to use the experience of real observers. And, uh, and you know, I am not a, a real observer. Uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm doing some spectroscopic observations, but not in, in remote uh, conditions uh, for real. And then uh, I'm, I'm probably not the best guy to, to talk, so I would just have a very short uh, talk at the beginning to, to present things. But uh, then we will we'll give the, the microphone to the guys who has real experience. And the idea, of course, of this uh, uh, meeting is to give you ideas to show you the path, uh, if you want to show, show you the way, if you want to, to go uh, to this uh, direction. Okay? And uh, yes, the last point is that we, we, we think that uh, we'll have uh, uh, something like uh, two hours uh, maximum for this meeting. And by the way, we had the same meeting in French uh, last week, where one, one week ago, and uh, it was very successful. And it was, uh, it, it, was not exactly, it was not exactly the same meeting because we don't have the, exactly the same participants and uh, the same uh, presenters uh, today. So it will be slightly different, which is very interesting. And, uh, but anyway, of course, it will be available um, in replay. And maybe Olivier, you can, you can explain us in few words uh, uh, who uh, will present uh, tonight. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, so this night uh, in this workshop, uh, we have uh, in fact uh, five, uh, five uh, uh, speakers. The first one is François, uh, François Cochard. Uh, his uh, subject is uh, to talk about uh, generalist uh, view of the remote, uh, remote uh, observation. And then uh, we have uh, me <laughs> with uh, an experience about the two spot, uh, the two spot adventure uh, with a setup, a spectroscopic setup in Chile. Uh, after we have uh, Mathieu Lelin, uh, who talk about uh, special process uh, ARP. ARP is uh, a, a process uh, made by uh, Mathieu to uh, automatic uh, process spectra uh, on our setup. ARP mean automatic. Um, ARP, air, air, what is it? Air is it? Uh, uh, I, 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 prediction. Uh, sorry, but yes, <laughs> automatic projection pipeline. So it's a uh, it's a great tools to do uh, spectra in automatic mode. After we have uh, uh, Alain Mori uh, from Space. Space is San Pedro de Atacama uh, uh, Celestian uh, uh, pro, uh, Celestian. Uh, je ne sais plus. I don't know the lights. Uh, the lights uh, le uh, letter. But uh, uh, Alain is uh, is settled in San Pedro de Atacama in Chile, and he is hosting a telescope in remote, so uh, he can talk uh, about his experience and uh, all this uh, 
uh, all the problem or issues that we can you you have in remote operation. And last, uh, we finish with Alain Klotz. Alain Klotz is a professional, is an astronomer, prof astronomer a professional astronomer who made um, remote operations since more than 20 years. So he's a very very uh, uh, a good uh, intervenant about uh, remote operation, and uh, he have to he, he must uh, share his experience with all together. So now we start with uh, François. Uh, for the first speakers. Thank you, Olivier. And by the way, we're still, wait, still waiting for uh, Alain and Alain, so Alain Klotz and Alain Maury. So we cross our finger that they will join us uh, very soon. Uh, anyway, uh, so we talk about, um, oops. We talk about um, uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, remote observations, and um, I will uh, I will talk uh, quickly about uh, what, what means uh, remote observation. But wh why do we do uh, remote observations? The, the difference, the nuances uh, of the remotes. Uh, there, there, are, there are many ways to do some remote uh, observations in, in astronomy and, and in spectroscopy. And um, also, uh, I'll talk about specific requirements uh, for spectro, mainly compared uh, to uh, imaging. Um, so why are we doing some uh, remote observations? There are a lot of good reasons, uh, but they are, all are very different and, and can draw to very different uh, solutions. Uh, the one good reason is to get a better weather than at home. And, uh, uh, of course, so in Europe, there, there is a lot of uh, observers that goes to Morocco, for instance, or also to the South America, to Chile, uh, and, and this kind of uh, region where the weather is just wonderful. And uh, this is one of the good reasons. But you, are, you are also have this kind of situation in the US, uh, where uh, I know that, for instance, in New Mexico, or uh, in some places like that, uh, there are some uh, um, uh, remote observatories uh, for a lot of people that, that are uh, elsewhere in the US. Um, another uh, good reason is to access to the other sky, so the, the south sky for northern people or the northern sky for southern, uh, southern uh, people. And uh, of course, th this is something important. This is, I think, the, the one of the reasons for the two spot uh, project that uh, Olivier will talk about. And this is, of course, a very good reason. Uh, there are all uh, other very basic uh, reasons. So it is cold. It is cold outside. So for me, this is my case. Well, not at the moment we are because in, in France we are in summer and the, the weather is wonderful and the temperature is quite high. But uh, during winter, it's uh, really uh, cold to to work uh, uh, close to the telescope. And, uh, and also, uh, I must sleep during the night. And this is something which is very complex. I, I don't know uh, how it is for you, but uh, I cannot work uh, all day long and, and, and observe all night long because I, I need to sleep some time. And this is another uh, very good reason to let uh, the computer controlling the, uh, controlling the instrument. Um, uh, another good reason is to have uh, to improve the return on investment because uh, um, the cost of our instrument is quite high, and when we when we invest in such instrument, we want to be able to uh, spend a lot of observing time, and uh, and, and this is uh, very good to have again an, an automatic system to do it. Um, uh, a very a, a very different reason is uh, uh, you know that um, I like the proverb uh, proverb that says uh, well if it works don't fix it and when you have a stable uh, setup it's very good to not touch at it at all and and let it work uh, if you work remotely uh, then this is a good um, reliable solution because it means that you never have um, any uh, manual intervention and, and risk uh, to uh, unplug a cable or, or touch something. So it's it's really a question uh, of reliability. And by the way, we are in a uh, we are in a, in a wonderful time. Well, we are in a crazy world, crazy world on one side, on one hand. But on the other hand, we are also in a wonderful way, uh, world 
where we have the technology and, and we, uh, there are a lot of uh, new technology uh, solution that open new doors. I'm especially thinking, for instance, about the astrometry, uh, the, the um, uh, blade solving uh, that, that allows to detect in the image the, the exact position of the image just by recognizing the pattern of stars in the image. So, for instance, but of course we have the, the CCD camera, we have the go, the go to mount and, and so on. But the, this technology is uh, really something wonderful for us today. Um, now, the, the, because of that, because of these different uh, reasons, um, uh, we have uh, um, a different, um, uh, what, I, what I call the different nu nuances of the remote. Um, well, when we talk about remote, very often we consider that we will use uh, our telescope very far away. Uh, this is not my own approach uh, because I know that the, the, if, you are, if your telescope is far away uh, from you or from your home, uh, it will be very expensive. And uh, of course, I will not have the same uh, sky at home that in, in Chile, for instance, but uh, I will not have the same cost. Also the, the, as well, and, and this is something very important. So we have to talk about the, uh, the hosting, uh, the reliability. So you meant you have to double uh, a lot of equipment to be sure that if one breaks, uh, you can have a backup solution. You have to talk to think about the maintenance, the accommodations and so on, and the, the trips uh, to go there. And this is something very expensive. Um, there are different ways to, to, to do uh, remote observations. Uh, the, the first, the, the basic one is just your instrument is far away and you, you observe remotely, but you, the observer, remain the boss. Okay, so you, you take the control of the instrument and you are observing the same way as if you were just beside the telescope. This is the first, uh, the first approach. Uh, the second step for me is the automatic observations. It means in this case that the observer can sleep during the night. It, it, he, he is responsible for the observation, but he will uh, give uh, to the telescope an observing plan for the night, and then he will take care of the result uh, the, day, the day after. Okay, so the, in this case, uh, he will, the, the observer will not be present during the observation, but he is uh, the boss anyway, and he gives uh, a close control uh, he has the, the close, close control of the telescope. And the third level, uh, which is uh, the, the, most, uh, the most fascinating for me, um, the, 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 the one, the one that, that made me uh, dreaming is uh, to have a robotic observation. So in this case, uh, all the system is fully automated from uh, building the ob observing plan to archive. And of course it will include uh, the data reduction, the observations, the data reduction and sharing the results um, uh, to the different databases uh, that, that are uh, involved uh, in these programs. Okay, so this is really uh, for me the, something wonderful because in this case I can really uh, do something else and, uh, and the system will really uh, take care of all the operational uh, activity. Uh, so the K in this case, and this is something that I learned from uh, Anna Klotz a uh, long time ago, is really uh, that you have to manage a very uh, big data flux. And you have a lot of data to, to, to take care. And, uh, and you, you have really to consider that the, the core of the system is the process to manage the data. So, I mean, not only the, the data reduction, but also, also the uh, uh, validation system, also uh, uh, sending the results to the different databases that you need and so on. So the, the, it must be fully automatic. And in this case, uh, we, we have to consider that the instrument is just a sensor, uh, uh, just a, a spectral sensor, something very basic uh, to, to, to take spectral in fact, and, and to fulfill uh, the process. You have to understand that in all these different cases, so remote observation, automatic observation, or robotic observations, uh, in the different situations, the user interface is totally different. In this case, you have to have exactly the same user interface as if you were uh, just beside uh, the telescope. But in the other, in the robotic one, you don't have any 
you don't need any more any um, uh, user interface because you you just have to to manage uh, the results and you just have to have something totally different to to fulfill or to to give uh, the program to the to the system but in in any case the the software tools uh, are totally different um just a few words so i'm i'm not uh, well I do have a remote system in my backyard, so it is at a few meters from where I am uh, at the moment. So I'm uh, in in the in my control room in, in fact, in fact, and uh, this is uh, the setup that I have in, in my backyard. Uh, well, I, I do have an, an RC8, uh, which I question eight inches. I do have a uh, ten micron uh, mount. Uh, I do have a UVX uh, spectroscope. And I'm lucky because uh, I guess that you can see the mouse. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm um, uh, testing the the, uh, the 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 prototype of demotorization for the UX. So uh, I, I, I'm I'm really uh, working to uh, with, with the remote uh, UX, uh, which is, which will be available very soon. I do have a telescope shelter that I've uh, already spoken about uh, in the past. And um, everything is controlled from home, so uh, it is controlled from where I am at the moment. And uh, I'm working under Linux uh, for this uh, controlling the installation. I'm working with the castars uh, mainly uh, for for the, for simplicity reason, and I'm also working with the metro uh, for the uh, data for the, the spectral acquisition and reduction. And I do have two Raspberry Pis. The one is control uh, the um, the shelter and the weather station, and the other one is uh, to control the um, the instruments. So the the indie server uh, that controls the, mount, the different cameras um, and uh, uh, the focuser and so on. And now it's for the the UX uh, system. And I'm really pushing, sorry, I'm really pushing to go through a, a full uh, Python uh, system uh, and, and, uh, because I, I really think that this is the, uh, the, the wonderful solution and it can manage very low uh, level uh, devices as well as uh, databases and, and, and big systems. And, um, now, uh, just to finish, um, I, I, I do have, um, I do think that the spectroscopy have some specificities compared to imaging. I really think that when you are doing imaging, you can have a generic software uh, because I think that all people that are doing uh, imaging rem or remotely or not remotely have the same needs. So we need to collect the, the images of the, of the sky, the, the flat images, uh, um, dark images, bias images, and so on, and and the process, the, the 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 processing is almost the same. Whatever is the, the kind of observation that you are doing. So of course that there the, the, there are some differences uh, if you are doing uh, um, high resolution uh, planetary images or, or deep sky imaging. But generally speaking, the 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 the, the, the process that you you need is almost the same, and then you can have something which is very, uh, very generic. I think that in Spectro, this is not the case anymore. So, there are some specificities. Well, for instance, you have to put the star in the slit. Uh, so I guess that this will be really under control very soon. So it, it is already, uh, we have already some automated uh, solution, but uh, they are not available in, in the uh, in, in gen generic software. Uh, like uh, ICP or Prism or software like that. So uh, at the moment, this is not available, but maybe in some time it can be. But the, the major difference for me is that when, when you have to talk about data reduction process, uh, this data reduction process really depends on the instrument and even on the observing program. So it depends if if you are looking uh, specifically for the uh, radial velocity precision, or if you're looking at the, the um, uh, uh, response curve corrections uh, to have the relative intensities of different rays and, and so on. 
so the, the different uh, lines sorry and and so on so it, i think really that's when you are doing spectroscopy at one moment we have to put the hands on and uh, we you have to enter in the code and you have to develop some tools uh, to to make your own um, uh, uh, scripts your own processing your own uh, data controlling okay and and by the way uh, it, it is very uh, all the installations that i know uh, manage different observing programs so uh, you are, you can observe b stars you can observe hourly array you can observe planetary nebulae and so on and these different programs require different uh, uh, processing also and different way to 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 play with the data uh, this is my last slide, uh, just uh, talking about the software, uh, what I see is that, um, uh, so you, you know that I often say that when you are doing spectroscopy, we are, we are doing only uh, simple things, uh, but the problem is that we, are, we have to put under control of a lot of th simple things, okay, so there is nothing complex, we are not uh, doing quantic mechanics, we are doing a very basic uh, <laughs> mechanics, uh, but the, 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 the problem is that we have a lot of things to put under control. And uh, when we do that, in fact, we have two different approaches regarding the software. Either we have something which is very integrated or we have something which is modular. And, and both exist and, and this, this, hmm, um, this choice always exists when you are in this kind of situation. In the industry, this is something which is very common. You have to choose between something which is integrated or something which is uh, modular. Uh, the ad advantage of an integrated system is that you have a single uh, environment, so you, you have to uh, learn um, or to discover only one tool. And um, but the, uh, the the on the other way, if you uh, if you go for a modular system, you have to discover or control uh, several tools. Um, with an integrated system, you have an all-in-one system, so uh, everything is controlled in the same system, which is very comfortable. Uh, but by experience, we know that uh, every brick of the system is probably not the best, uh, the, the best in class um, uh, or the best in the world uh, for this specific uh, application. I'm talking about acquisition, I'm talking about uh, auto guiding, I'm uh, talking about uh, data, uh, data processing or data reduction and things like that. So it's very difficult to have an integrated software for which all the bricks are very optimal. Um, the, the, and uh, you also have to think at long term, this is something very important. The setup I have in my backyard, it will have to work at least for 10 years, and really at least for 10 years, and I hope uh, that it will be, be uh, much more than that. And 10 years is very long compared to uh, the, the, the software industry and, and, the, and, and the technology in which we are today. So for sure, I will have to change some uh, elements. And then we I have to talk to think about the maintenance, most probably some of the elements will die and I have to, to replace them. And also uh, we know that um, probably in, in 10 years from now, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, much more uh, efficient cameras, for instance, or mounts or things like that. So I, I will have to think about that. And then I will have to be able to adapt the system to these evolutions. And for me, my preference without any doubt is to go to a modular system because, and I want to, to have something very simple, each brick, each element must be very simple because this is the key for the reliability. And I, I really love the open source code, but it's not only, it's not only a question of, of love, it's really a question of it is more efficient in the long term. So I'm sure that uh, the Python bricks, for instance, uh, will be available in, in 15 years uh, from now. And I'm not sure that any specific software that exists today with a given editor will be still there in 10 years. And this is something very important. And then for me, uh, today, the Python solution is really the key. So I know it's not very common at the moment. Well, we, I, I've, I've not seen a lot of remote observation observatories uh, working in, in Python, 
but all the bricks are, are going to this direction. And I think this is really the, 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 the way uh, to follow. And by the way, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, no, I think that uh, is not uh, online yet, uh, Alain Clot, but I, I see that Anna Maurice is here. Hello, Alain. And the, the, um, I want to say that um, uh, Alain uh, Clot, so did develop I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe oh, more than 15 years ago, uh, Odola software. So, it, it, and it was really a visionary software. And this is uh, the, really the, the good idea of what we should have today. The, the, the only problem for the Odola is that it was developed in TQL TK language, which is not common at all today, where the Python is becoming, is be, became the, the, the most uh, uh, usual software we have. Uh, uh, in astronomy uh, today, but really the structure was there. So it was open source. It was a very modular system. It was, uh, it had a very good documentation to be able to add your own modules and so on. So really, this is the, this was the idea. So the problem is that uh, too too few people are are using it today, uh, and, and the development are almost done. But uh, this was really the, the the good idea. And so my my my. Personally, I will push to go uh, towards Python everywhere in my observatory. And that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I give the microphone to uh, Olivier. Thank you, uh, François, for your presentation. Uh, I now I will now present um, uh, our uh, two spots uh, adventure. Uh, so uh, I have some. Uh, slide to show you. Uh, first, here is uh, the, the view of the observatory in Chile. Uh, we have uh, our setup in one of these shelters since uh, more than one year now. So it's, uh, we have uh, one year of experience for remote operation in Chile. And uh, who are we? So we are um, we are a, a team of French, five French amateur astronomers. We decide to to um, build a non-profit organization we call the Two Spot. The Two Spot means Southern Spectroscopic Project Observatory Team. And uh, with the, the fiscal law in France, we are uh, authorized to receive donations. So it's very helpful to have some money to to buy uh, material, telescope, mount, uh, spectrograph, and so on. And uh, also, we have uh, the support of several structure organizations. So uh, it's uh, it, it. Oh, sorry, I come. Uh, organization and company, so it's very helpful to have uh, the support of a professional structure to help us to build uh, this project. And of course, we collaborate uh, from a pro M uh, project in spectroscopy, uh, only spectroscopy. Uh, I, I, we with this remote uh, observator, uh, observatory, we only do a spectroscopy. So we are supported by uh, many professional uh, and uh, commercial uh, uh, structure. Uh, uh, we have uh, the support of some magazine on individual uh, support. Uh, we have agreement with Astrophysics Institute, uh, with some French uh, Institute, uh, Italian Institute, uh, uh, Chinese uh, Institute. Uh, uh, and also, we have the financial aid from uh, many uh, amateur astronomers. So they give money uh, for us uh, to help us uh, building this project. So the team, we have five amateurs. Uh, so you can see in the pictures all the five with Thomas, me, uh, Stéphane, Pascal and Lionel. And uh, we we have we, we use some uh, software uh, some uh, software that uh, everybody knows uh, the Prism first 
presumes on the Maxim DL. Why we use this software? Because in these two software, all is integrated. You have the uh, planet, planetarium function, you have auto guiding function, you have acquisition from function from CCD. You have all integrated in these two software, and these two software can be with scriptable function. So it's very useful to do automatic operation uh, with these two software. And then for uh, reduction, for uh, the reduction, uh, for spectral reduction, we use uh, mainly ISIS. ISIS made uh, by Christian Brill and uh, SpecInT make, made also by Christian Brill, but uh, SpecInT is, uh, is a new one uh, made with a Python uh, routine. So uh, it's a new uh, new generation of, uh, of software in uh, spectral reduction. And uh, for all this uh, automatic process, we use ARP. ARP uh, means automatic reduction pipeline uh, made by Mathieu Lelin, who speak after just after me. And uh, ARP is uh, just a wonderful tool uh, to just uh, uh, do the reduction of uh, all the spectra of the night automatically. So uh, I will explain after how it works. And to remote control all uh, this equipment, we use uh, AnyDesk. But of course, we can use other software like uh, uh, um, the other, I don't remember the name. Uh, it's TeamViewer, yes. Or you can use uh, uh, the desk of uh, Windows 10 or something like that. There are many software where to, to take uh, uh, control at distance uh, other computer. So how uh, the automatic observation uh, work? Uh, then uh, first, uh, at the beginning of the uh, just before the beginning of the night, uh, we have to to make uh, a text file uh, like uh, like you see here, uh, with the name of the object we want to take a spectrum, the coordinate in right ascension and declination. And uh, here is just an indication for the software. It's a uh, magnitude, the expected magnitude of this object. And after we have some parameters, I, I don't know, I don't describe here, but it's uh, um, uh, it's some parameter to say uh, if we want to take uh, 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 six exposure, for example, or uh, we have to also to to uh, to say to the to the script uh, how much exposure we want to do. But uh, so this is special for this script. And we have to say to the software if you want to do auto guiding or not, or if you have to refocus uh, the star on the slit or not. On the last uh, information, it's uh, what kind of object is it? Is it an OVA? Is it a BS star? Is it a symbiotic star? Etc. Etc. So this is a, a very basic uh, uh, text file. We submit it in our setup in Chile, and then all the rest of the uh, of the operation is uh, uh, it's automatic. Then Prism script, uh, we have a Prism script made by Stéphane Charbonnel. Uh, it's a very, very long script, about uh, two, more than 2,800 uh, lines. So it's a very, very uh, huge uh, script. But all is automatic. He start uh, the camera. He, he, he go, he say to the man to go to this target. Uh, he point uh, the target into the slit and then uh, do auto guiding on the star close to the slit and then take, uh, take one exposure to, to check the amount of ADU uh, we have in a single exposure, let's say, of one minute, and then extrapolate to determine the best, uh, the best uh, exposure time, and so on, and uh, do all the target uh, in the night. And then, in the morning, then the ARP process uh, come here to process automatically all the target of the night. ARP go on our, our uh, computer, take the data, and uh, copy it in, uh, into another uh, computer, 
and process all the SpecWave with the SpecInT uh, software that, uh, made by Christian Brill. And then after one or two hours after the, the, the last night, we have all the results present in a dashboard. So we can see uh, all, all the, the spectra uh, radius. And uh, we have an email. Uh, an email is sent to all of the observers of the two spot. And in the dashboard, we can decide if this uh, spectrum is good or not. And we can, uh, in fact, check all the results of the night before the app process send the result to the dedicated professional uh, who need uh, this uh, this uh, this spectrum. For example, if uh, we have made a, a Nove uh, spectrum, uh, the spectrum go directly to uh, Steve Shore. Steve Shore is an astrophysician in the Pisa University. So uh, Steve Shore have the result just one hour after the, the observation, and so on for the BS database for uh, symbiotic star is. Yaroslav in Czechy and so on. So uh, we dedicate, we, we have chosen a site in uh, Chile. Uh, you, you can see here the, the red dot uh, Chile is uh, uh, not so far from uh, the town of uh, La Serena. Uh, uh, the site is uh, up to uh, more than 5,500 feet. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, 300 uh, clear night per year, so it's a very good uh, site. But in Chile, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the tradition to have uh, a good sky uh, all the time, except now. Uh, <laughs> now we have some snow uh, because it's a period in Chile, in winter in Chile, so uh, we have uh, bad weather uh, now. Uh, but we, we hope that we can uh, observe uh, again uh, in some, uh, some days. And it's a very dark sky. Uh, magnitude of the dark sky is about 21 or 22, so it's very dark. And uh, this is the deep sky chili. We, 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 we have our setup in this sky chili observatory. And uh, I, uh, I just put here the, the website of this uh, company. So our uh, setup choice, uh, first we have the first uh, setup is uh, Richer Chrétien uh, 12 inch telescope on a 10 micron mount uh, GM uh, 3000 HPS mount. Uh, we have uh, uh, an LP 600 watt spectrograph, so a low resolution spectrograph and the two uh, CCD camera, one for the spectral camera and uh, the other for auto guiding. And also we have uh, some accessories like the finger, find, finder scope, uh, uh, just some time to do some photometry or uh, to do uh, just uh, an image of our target. So of course we have uh, some additional material like uh, electronic and remote power supply control. Uh, we have uh, an electrical cabinet uh, equipped with all uh, all power supply, uh, IP switch control, Ethernet switch, and so on. And of course, our uh, local PC on screen. Uh, that's uh, we have of course the test and retest and re retest this uh, material before send uh, uh, all in Chile. And uh, to, to control all the main supply, uh, we use uh, IPX800 uh, 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 web interface. It's very useful because uh, you can, of course, uh, control directly on, uh, on a um, web navigator all the, the switch of the power supply. But of course, uh, for the IPX, we have also uh, uh, an ISCOM driver uh, that we can control uh, this switch directly with uh, Prism software or Maxim Dial uh, software. 
And of course, we have uh, the MG Box V2. It's a, a small box just to have a GPS for uh, the coordinate of the site and also the temperature or the pressure. Uh, this all this information is included in the fit header of uh, each uh, each spectra. So uh, in March 2021, uh, we have two uh, two wooden box uh, with all the material inside, and uh, we shipping it by ship because it's more uh, cheaper than by plane. And uh, 40 days after of travel, uh, the two uh, boxes arrive in Chile uh, at the observatory uh, of uh, Deep Chai, uh, Chile. We, we do a, a small uh, video. Uh, you can see on YouTube, our YouTube channel here. This is the address uh, here, the link. And uh, it's, it's a very <laughs> great, a great adventure to see that uh, our two boxes, after uh, more than uh, 15,000 kilometers, arrived in good condition at the observatory. So uh, just 14, uh, 24 days after, uh, because we, we have to install the material on the site, uh, we produce our first spectrum in remote uh, in, the, in May 2021. And it was uh, the first spectrum. It was a, a BS star, V1078 Scorpion. Uh, and of course, we have to also a small uh, video here. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I just put my. No, it's not the the choice I want to do. Okay, but you have here the the link to see the video of the first light of uh, our first spectrum uh, in Chile. So uh, our observation program, for, we have, uh, in fact, we, we, we do uh, mainly confirmation of PN uh, candidates. There are many, many PN candidates, uh, uh, more than 600 uh, PN candidates. And we try uh, to do spectra uh, from this PN candidate to uh, validate or not if it's a PN or not. Uh, we also a program. Uh, we have a program of uh, beer stars because there are uh, many, many beer stars. More than 1,000 uh, beer stars who don't have any spectrum in the best database. We also do uh, symbiotic or cataclysmic stars, novae, supernovae, or comet, or other event in the sky. To, uh, uh, when the when there are something in the sky uh, to, to 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 see. For example, uh, here the spectrum of uh, PN candidates. Our uh, PN candidate is very, very weak target, about uh, magnitude uh, 19 to 20. So uh, you can see here the continuum of the spectrum is very noisy. But uh, you can see uh, here the emission line of uh, H alpha or uh, nitrogen also. And here, uh, another candidate, of course, of, uh, of uh, another uh, PN candidate, very weak uh, candidate. And uh, since uh, more than one year, we have uh, some uh, publication, uh, some uh, telegram, astronomer, astronom, uh, astro telegrams, uh, mainly for uh, symbiotic stars, like this one, or uh, this one, or uh, another one, uh, this one, because it was uh, uh, an outburst of this uh, this target. And uh, we have a research note about uh, a new uh, recently discovered accreting symbiotic stars, THA1531. And uh, another one, uh, another target, uh, we have an telegram, astro telegram. And the last one uh, was in uh, June the 15th, uh, but uh, this one, it's uh, not uh, symbiotic, it's a uh, novae uh, that we have uh, uh, a tel an astronomer telegram with other friends from uh, Australia uh, and New Zealand. Also. Uh, so uh, Amish is from New Zealand and Peter Velez is uh, from uh, Australia. 
So uh, we we just uh, we just packaging our uh, second setup, uh, and we will send uh, uh, to Chile uh, in just uh, some uh, some days. Uh, the second setup is dedicated to high resolution spectroscopy with an HL uh, spectrograph. Uh, and uh, so we have now uh, two optical systems on the same mount uh, with uh, another, enfin, with the two uh, optical of uh, three, uh, three and three hundred uh, millimeter in diameter. So this is uh, this new uh, uh, spectrograph. Uh, Uh, will take uh, will take place uh, in October 2022, and we hope to make our first spectrum uh, in beginner in beginning of the November 2022. So that's all. Uh, and uh, after all presentation, if you have uh, some question, I, uh, I I was very happy to to answer it. So now uh, I will give the speak to Mathieu, who explain us how to uh, how the pipeline app work. Okay, thank you, Olivier. I think it, it, it's good for my screen sharing. Um, uh, we'll, because I see. Uh, okay, so hi everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you. I will talk uh, about uh, ARP, uh, Automatic Reduction Pipeline. Um, and uh, uh, for this uh, talk, um, my uh, my plan, um, my objective, my goal is today is to share with you my recipe. Uh, about this uh, ARP, uh, if I can say. And for this, I will talk first about the initial requirements of two spots. Um, and we talk about the process step and we zoom about uh, speaking T and the automation of uh, all these, uh, these things. So um, let's go for this process. Um, Olivier speak just before about uh, um, the two-spot process, um, uh, two-spot setup, sorry, uh, the remote setup in Shell um, um, for two-spot. Uh, I don't um, talk about it uh, again, um, but uh, approximately um, one, like, uh, one, um, one year ago, he sent a, a mail about uh, Uh, a lot of data who, who accumulated because they have 329 clear nights, nights approximately by years, uh, actually. And if we take um, four to five spectra targets per night, uh, there is a lot of data accumulation. Uh, and all the process, all the treatment um, takes time, uh, uh, for sure. So you need to have a regularity of treatment because uh, uh, otherwise the, the data will be uh, accumulate. Um, and uh, we are humans. So if, so if you haven't a very rigorous procedure, you can make mistake because uh, there is a lot of data uh, and uh, you make a, a lot of uh, treatment every day. So he sent a, a mail uh, uh, after July uh, last year and uh, he, he, he asked, he, he talked about uh, a dream perhaps uh, uh, um, for perhaps we can automate this process and uh, can we think uh, together about it. Uh, so I, There is some exchange, uh, exchange about uh, email, and I take all the exchange and I write it on paper and I identify three blocks, um, three big blocks. The first, it is the, um, um, the automatic acquisition observation, you know. Uh, the second, it is the automatic reductions. And the third, it is what can we do with this data? Um, if, um, after the process. Um, I don't talk again about automatic acquisition because um, Olivier talked about it. And it is Stéphane Charbonnel who make a, a script um, for Prism who um, uh, make automatic acquisition. So every night you take some spectra. And after this, um, the night, we have some session files, uh, some spectra and all the files 
are uh, download on the, the NAS, um, the network disk of two spot in France. And the job become here for uh, come here um, start here for the reduction process. So um, I have made some parts, some blocks. Uh, the first is to go check on the NAS to uh, retrieve and verify if there is some session file, if there is a, a night observation and get this file. I don't touch uh, about the session file because it is a referential, you know, uh, I, I don't modify it. I just make a copy and I retrieve this copy on the two spot server. It is a Linux uh, server. Um, so I get all the file. I make a backup, a local backup. Uh, I think it is important. I am not an expert about automation, but I think it is very important to backup at each step each step um, if, if for be sure if you have a network, um, a network failure or an electricity disrupt, uh, you, you need to back up your files. And after that, I launch the reductions. Um, when we have the result files, I prepare um, a delivery. Um, for example, here uh, uh, I add some two spot logo on the graph, on the, the spectrum um, plot. And uh, I create a folder for each object. And on inside each folder, I put whole files about this object. Uh, after that, I make again uh, a local backup and I send files to the NAS, to the network disk uh, in other folder for, for sure. And I send a notification to uh, the astronomers to say, okay, uh, everything is good, your file is ready. Or if there is a, a problem uh, on each block, I send a mail to, uh, uh, to notify uh, there is a problem on it uh, at this moment. Um, one thing, uh, I, I think something important here, uh, I have made a a file or a process in Python of each block and each file is independent. So um, the process is, um, is all this file uh, you can send uh, one after one. And um, tomorrow or next year, if we change the schedule solution, our scripts are, are again uh, good and you can use it uh, um, just launch it and, and the process will, 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 be go, will go. Um, if we look at this, there is no very uh, intelligence in the step. If you, re, uh, you, you watch a retrieve, you, you, just, you have just to get file, copy file, um, make a plot, but all the intelligence of this process is in the reductions, uh, the reduction block it here. So I propose you to make a zoom about this part and take a moment to uh, speak about it. For the reduction, uh, I use PackinT. Um, um, the software has been developed by, by Christian Buell. He starts this program approximately at the same time um, of when I, I think about the, the process uh, with the exchange um, by mail. And um, this, um, this application, uh, the goal of this application is to reduce without intervention. So you have in input two files and you have your files, uh, your result files in input. Um, in input, you have two files, an observation file where you can find uh, the name of uh, your fits. Uh, the target, the flat, the dark, the offset, you know. And the other file is a setup config where you can find uh, the path, the setup configuration, and the, the type of process, process you, you want in, uh, in your reduction. For example, the, the, the mode of uh, the calibration mode. So um, we have here for reduction the two files. And what is important for automatic process is we need permanent names because we don't change uh, the name every day. The process need to know where is the file uh, for lunch uh, reduction. Um, another thing uh, very interesting about SpecInT is um, you, you have two mode uh, of um, usage. You, you have a guy uh, of the application, which is developed by Valérie Denou, and um, this guy uh, is um, over the core 
um, it is a Python script, and this Python script take in input these two files and uh, in output you have the result. So for us, it is very interesting here because you, we can use only the core. And another very interesting point is uh, I make some compilation of uh, the script for um, uh, for Linux and Mac OS and also Raspberry as a result of um, uh, a computed version for Windows. So it is very interesting for us because, as you know, um, we use a Linux server for the RRP um, process here. So, okay, we, we have our process, we have the reduction program, but our process need to be launched uh, manually. So it is not very automatic here. And we need a schedule program, uh, a trigger program uh, over all of this. I use uh, Apache Airflow for doing this. Uh, it is um, a, a very interesting application, which is maintained by Apache. So uh, it is, you can say it is a long-term support and it is open source. And this application, um, work uh, around um, some DAG, directed acyclic graphs, and um, it, it, it runs the process in one way. Uh, you don't have loop. You can have loop in your script, but you, you go, you run the process, and it makes the jobs. You have a, a scheduler. Uh, you have a scheduler and you have a web application for manage and follow up your process, watch the log, the duration, for example. So I use uh, this uh, application. Uh, I install it on the two spot server. And um, you have here, for example, all the steps of the process I just uh, speak before. Um, you can find this initial backup, the reduction, part delivery. And um, so it is the script, the Python script. Uh, and here we can see all, uh, there is uh, one more um, step here, but the screenshot have been taken at two two different moments, but you have you know, all the step and you read it vertically. So each day the process trigger at um, 14 o'clock and uh, run all the script and you have it if, uh, if it's uh, green, everything is okay. If it's red, there is a problem, a mail is sending. Um, and you, can, you have some different view. You can see the landing time. So you can see uh, details with the log. You can calendar with all the process of months, for example. So it is a very interesting um, application and um, very, um, very powerful. And you can also have other DAG. Uh, for example, here we have the two-spot DAG Halpy, which is made. And if, for example, you have another setup, you can have another DAG with other input, other output another um, trigger time, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if, we, if tomorrow, if we, change this software tomorrow, we have again the script, the Python script for our process, so no problem. Um, here we have, uh, so we have the, um, the second block, the reduction block, so uh, everything is okay. Uh, and we have some data after, the data is recorded in the output folder. But um, after, the, after this, what can we do about this data? I think about it uh, at the moment and I say, okay, I will, talk, I will think about it and I make a web application uh, because for the first version of this IRP software, uh, I think uh, um, we need to control, we need to, to validate the data uh, because uh, in the first version, we, we have to be sure the data is correct and uh, to send it in the database, to send it in, in the NAS. So I make a web application and the astronomer can come uh, the morning or, or, or the, two, the next day and um, connect to the NAS by this application and check if there is some file in the output and they have a dashboard for, um, for check all file and check if everything is valid. So this is the dashboard. You have, this is a GIF, uh, it will run. Uh, will be loop. You have the spectrum here. You have the the the, the first spectrum uh, image. You have the list here of the um, all the spectra on the night. For each object, if we click about uh, on this object, you have the header. You have the the spectral field, 
the sky field, sorry. And I add a metadata, metadata file for two spots where they can record, for example, the, um, the weather station, uh, the weather station information, and the dashboard can show it. You have Haleda. And here uh, at the bottom of the dashboard, you can validate the spectrum or delete. You don't really delete, it is just uh, you move the data in another folder to verify manually with other software like uh, ISIS, uh, uh, etc. This tool is only to a quick check. You know, the astronomer comes and uh, they just want if the data are okay, if the, 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 the face of the spectrum is approximately okay uh, for the next step. So uh, if they click on valid, the spectrum go in a folder of all the valid um, spectrum and the information about it is sent in a database. Um, you have here um, a little button, which I call I name it quick reports. And uh, when you click uh, on it, uh, all the button are hide. And uh, I put some logo and I make a, a PNG or a PDF about all the information. You can add uh, some astrometry. You can set it to professional um, or database or, or some people uh, or um, on the web, for example, to talk about uh, the spectrum. You can also go to the database um, uh, database link in the dashboard and you have all the spectrum you have validated before. Um, you can click on it and have the spectrum and the header and you can download the package. The package is all the file about this object, the spectrum, the PNG with the logo, um, the metadata, uh, etc. So um, that's um, uh, at this moment um, what is RP and the dashboard. Then all of the data are in database and the spec in the NAS in a folder, the referential folder. And uh, we uh, associate with this work, this work, I create also um, astronomical documentation because we need to know about how to use it and a developer uh, documentation uh, for sure. And uh, we think, uh, we already think about um, uh, the future and I, you have probably seen on the slide before, I had a button um, sent to BES because uh, um, I work uh, on it uh, at this moment. Um, astronomer could, for example, if the, the spectrum is about a BE stars, they can send it a mail automatically with the fits to the database best and uh, okay we have a, a fit uh, you can take it and we have the first we have made the first uh, update this uh, this week on rrp and uh, for example uh, now the um, the process can take some different setup config files um, during the night if the temperature change and the, the calibration, uh, calibration uh, polynomial change, uh, you, can, uh, you can take different files uh, from different parts of the night, for example. So, um, so that's it. And uh, it is, uh, um, it is uh, important for me to, to share it because perhaps some people want to make their their process and perhaps there is some part of this work to, who can interesting some people. So this application, this work is a two spot uh, customized tool. This is for us, uh, for them. And um, I, I work at this moment about extraction of the general concept uh, about how this work. And I am writing a post and I prepare codes for share to everyone um, and I will uh, I will post it about my website on my website next um, next week uh, approximately and I will also make um, uh, I, I will also, also share the code of the dashboard and probably make a, a docker image and whole will be open source I just extract the two sport particularities you know um, okay that's good but Perhaps uh, you, you can say me, uh, okay, that's very interesting, but I am not a developer and how can I make an automatic process if I'm not a developer? And I, I, I think about it and I try to reproduce this pipeline on a no-code uh, application. The no-code is a tendency, uh, um, a, a very interesting tendency uh, with no dev, you know, no code. And the, this is a pre-programmed software blocks. You can 
assembly and it is very easy to use. Uh, so you can try to make some application and process with it. And I, there is a lot of a kind of, uh, of software, but I used N8N. This is a multi operating system. You can use it on uh, Windows, Mac OS, uh, uh, Linux, and also Raspberry. And this is free if you use the application, the desktop application, or if you self uh, install, you self host it on your, your server. There is also a cloud version, but it is uh, it is uh, with cost. So I used uh, this application, and for example, here um, you have um, the dashboard here, the, the the workspace. Sorry, and on the right you have some nodes. You can pick some nodes and drag and drop on the workspace and create some process and link it, link the nodes um, together. For example, here we have a node for read from read a file with a CSV file. And here I set the name of my file and we can start the process with a crown. Um, if you use the Linux, you, you probably know about it. You can, uh, you can trigger process, you can trigger the application every day uh, at uh, 14, uh, for example. So I use this application and I replace all the process of two spot, for example. So you have the check. Uh, um, so you, you for this example, um, we can take the example of somebody who have, a, a, you know, a, a little house in the garden uh, with um, an observatory uh, and you have a computer in this and uh, you install N8N and, um, and, and this process will be check existing session in a folder, uh, make a local backup in the folder, launch specinty because we have some version about windows mac os etc and after that we can send notification uh, for example uh, by email or uh, you have an example here with the png of the result uh, to my uh, phone on telegram and um, after that i make again a backup for sure and uh, and that's it so every day uh, i cast out the process manually and I cut, uh, and uh, there is a crown also, and every day at 14, the process so trigger. Um, this is a, a good way to, to, um, to play with your, your process at first, but you can also um, try to construct it because on each node here, you can launch a Python script. So we can make a graphic process and on each node we can call all the Python script we have prepared before, uh, and I will share it um, uh, quickly. So uh, it is a good point for just play with it, but not perhaps a very long term, uh, long term application for it. So everything is on my website. I make a post uh, for macOS and Unix version uh, with code uh, of the process. You just have to copy and, and paste uh, and uh, and play with it. Um, that's all for me. I hope my English will be good. And uh, I let the, the talk, the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu, for your presentation. Um, and uh, now we we have uh, Alan Mori from uh, Space in San Pedro de Atacama in Chile, who explained uh, about uh, his hosting uh, telescope uh, company and uh, some tip about uh, remote operation. So Alain, it's uh, to you. Okay, uh, let me share the screen. Ta-da. That's the one. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some uh, information about what we do here. Uh, I have 20 slides, but I have to go quite fast. Um, the first thing I'd like to, uh, let's see, to do, how do I move to the next one? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The first first thing I want to talk about is what we call the Le Cacheux Triangle. Uh, Jean Le Cacheux is an astronomer from Paris Observatory, which may, which explains the incompatibility between uh, three different poles. That means family, astronomy, and work. Meaning that if you have a family and you have a work, it's very hard to do astronomy. Uh, but if you don't have a job, then you can have a family that can do some astronomy. Uh, if you have no family, then you can have a job in astronomy, but the three together is very hard to do. Uh, that leads us, of course, to the next point where 
why, why not to put a telescope in a remote site? Uh, basically, it's very it's very complicated when you have a, like a normal life, and you know I let you read, but you you know the idea that uh, most people living in the city when they want to observe they have to take the equipment, load the car, move away, unload. Uh, then, if you're lucky, the sky is still clear, and so on and so on. Then, at the end of your session, you have to go back, and you have really to be an adventurer uh, in order to. Uh, to, uh, to observe like this, because well, at best, most of the time you'll, you'll observe two nights per month and uh, it's not very, very practical, okay? Um, there are uh, five companies who are of, which are offering uh, telescope hosting in, in Chile. Uh, one of the kind of funny fact is that the, the five companies have been started by French people. It's very strange that no Chilean people have uh, made their observatories. Uh, there was a place uh, held by a Belgium guy, unfortunately, a few several years ago already he died. Um, so these places, uh, you know, Chile is like this. Um, all over the, the, the desert, I mean, of course, if you go to the south of Chile, there, there, are, there are the worst places in the world. It's raining every day and so on and so on. But uh, as far as the Atacama Desert, uh, on average, the older sites have about the same types of nights. Uh, where Paranal is located is really a lot better. Um, it's frequent to have like 340 and more uh, nights per year. Um, the main implantations are close to the observatory, the, the earlier observatory like Cerro Tololo, Pachon, and so on. In fact, all the, the, three, the four companies I told you about are this region. Uh, and uh, as uh, Olivier said, uh, right now there's been quite a lot of bad weather in the south. Uh, but what they have right now, they don't have uh, in January, February, where sometimes we have what we call the altiplanic winter. That means one of the reasons for which the Atacama Desert is so dry is that there is a oceanic uh, current coming from Antarctica. So the ocean is very, very cold. Um, we are in the, you know, in the tropical zone, the, the water should be like uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, like 20 or 30 degrees even. Uh, when it gets to 15, uh, 15 degrees would be like 60 or so uh, Fahrenheit degrees. So we have a very cold ocean, we have the very high Andes, and there is like an almost permanent uh, anticyclone uh, above, the, above, above this region, making it one of the driest places uh, on Earth. During the summer, the Austral summer, that means January, February, then this uh, anticyclone uh, weakens and we have an invasion of clouds coming from, uh, from Amazonia. But on average, it's really quite a different place. I observed in many other observatories before in France, in California and so on. Uh, observing in Chile is like, wow, it's a lot better. Um, most of the sites can reach uh, higher than magnitude 22 per arc second. Uh, of course, that's not the case if the Milky Way is in the is in it. In fact, in many places you can you know put your hand and you see the shadow of the Milky Way. So it, it's really something that um, you don't get in many other places in the world. Uh, I wanted to list a little bit what people expect when they put a a telescope on a on a remote site, where uh, the company has to take care of importation and installation of the equipment. Uh, in, installation means software, optics, mechanics, and so on. Um, you want to have all the sky available. That means uh, you don't want to have panels uh, hiding some of some of the sky. Um, and of course, close to the equator, one of the good things is that you get access to almost all the sky. Uh, from our place, which is like minus 23 degrees south, uh, that's Ursa Minor is the only constellation we we can never see. You expect dark sky, you expect protection, fast internet, uh, GPS time server, and uh, one important thing is quality maintenance. Um, you want the site to be available. Uh, well, sometime I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but anyway, uh, Frank is in vacation right now. I'm talking to Olivier now. Um, but if the road is covered by snow and you cannot get access to the telescope, 
Uh, I observed for three years at La Cia Observatory, and I remember what it is uh, going, uh, walking to the dome with one meter of snow was not exactly fun. Uh, you want to have like uh, equipment in order to repair rapidly any, any problem. Uh, in my case, I live on the site, so I can uh, very often intervene during the night. Uh, you want to have good uh, communication. Uh, the last thing you want is the guy that doesn't speak, speak your language and doesn't know anything about astronomy or computers. If, uh, if the guy doesn't know the difference between a USB and a DB9 connector, well, normally you're in trouble and you may have to lose uh, several nights before it's being repeat, uh, repaired. And of course, you wish to have <laughs> low installations and uh, uh, fees and yearly hosting fees. Uh, what we expect from the client, okay, uh, regular payment, that's very important. We, I've had problem with a Russian guy. Uh, I, I shot his uh, telescope because he was not paying me since two years. So, you know, there is a moment where <laughs> uh, the, the thing, uh, has to stop. Um, and we want you to send quality equipment. Uh, that's good for us. That's also good for you. If you send bad quality things, very quickly they fail. You lose a lot of night. We have to spend time working on them and so on and so on. The best is if you can test your equipment at your place, uh, at least like a few months, OK? Uh, make sure everything works. You can focus. Everything is uh, collimated and so on and so on. Uh, the good thing is when you do that, then you can ship as used equipment and not new equipment. So you, you can declare a lower value for, for customs. Um, as far as the mounts, I would say, you know, use direct drives. Uh, you're going to use a mount for, in a site for which it's not planned. I mean, most mounts which have gears, you know, I'm not going to tell you names of astrophysics, paramounts and so on and so on. Um, the typical user will use them two, three nights per month. Uh, you might use them 30 nights per month, and then very quickly they fail. Uh, at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, like 15 years ago, at the observatory, I had seven paramounts. All of them failed. All of them were had to be returned. And so right, right now, you know, just take direct drives. It's a lot better. It's faster, uh, more precise, and not not as expensive. In fact. Uh, you have to avoid uh, uh, weird optical collimation, uh, optical tubes. Um, everything that looks like a Cassegrain, corrected Cassegrain, is a bitch to collimate. Uh, we are going to spend a lot of time collimating it. You are going to pay a lot of hours uh, because uh, you know, or you know, it's really a mess to collimate on the paper. They look good. They can give like uh, three three micron images of a hundred millimeter field, but that's only if all the elements are adjusted to a tenth of a millimeter. As soon you know, it's I have had many optical tubes which could not be could not be collimated. Uh, so it's better to go with an optical system that's known to work uh, rather than some exotic things which give a lot of problem later. Uh, of course, forget about CCD cameras. Uh, if you use a typical, you know, thick CCD and you replace it by a thin CMOS, you gain a lot. You gain at least one magnitude in. Uh, uh, so you can almost use a smaller telescope, much cheaper, but use CMOS uh, devices. Uh, one of the one of the consequences is, that, of course, that F8 telescopes, you know, you don't need like four meter focal length anymore. One meter is plenty. Uh, with the type, this type of camera, the, 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 the bad thing is nobody sells, you know, short Newtonians. You have, uh, you have the Takahashi Epsilon, you have the Raza, but on the Raza, it's very hard to put a filter wheel. Um, and well, that's about it. Then it's a kind of like strange market. Uh, also know why you send the telescope to a remote place. Uh, very often I have contact with people who tell me I have a Newton Cassegrain, but I want to put, you know, uh, the refractor. Yeah, you know, the guy doesn't know the, you know, what he wants to do with the telescope. I much prefer to have somebody who is going to do a specific thing and use it like that, rather than to have to intervene and change a secondary mirror and do this and do that and so on and so on. Uh, to 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 me, I mean, very often these people are in fact not really interested in astronomy. They are interested in 
technical things with telescopes and so on. Uh, most of the people work seriously. They send the telescope, they set it up, then they run and they use it all the time like this because they know what they're doing and, and why they send the telescope. Uh, to us, there are better clients than the guy who doesn't know exactly what he wants to do. Uh, the maintenance uh, on the site, of course, we have the regular cleaning of the optics. Here it's very easy because it's only dust. So you go with uh, distilled water, ch -ch 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 -ch, the, the mirror is clean. You, you don't have any grease or things like this. Uh, failures, uh, that's from my experience. First are connections. Uh, unfortunately, all the equipment done is done with lousy connectors like uh, RG14, RG45, USBs, which are not done for, you know, surviving the in, outside. The good thing is at least uh, we don't have a lot of uh, humidity, but because of the dryness, sometimes we have a bad bad connection. So. I send, I receive an email, I go, I put some, you know, connector cleaner and the telescope works again for another two years. Uh, the other uh, cause of failure is mostly power, power supplies. So when you send the telescope, which is maybe 10, 20, $30,000, put another $20 of uh, power supplies, spare power supply. Another thing is poor quality domes. That's, well, something, I haven't found a dome which I liked, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Uh, we use here a, a clamshell and a roll of roofs. Uh, you open at night, you observe, you close at the end, and that's it. And then later, I mean, the, the other failures are like a few person. Most of the failures are connections, power supply, and problem with the domes. We have, a, they are called home dome, I think. And the system to open is made by cables, and it's really a mess, and it it fails, and so you have to spend a lot of time and so on and so on. Of course, we have sometimes failures. Uh, we have like weird failures, like uh, for example, uh, one guy took images and he had a very black spot on the on the on the chip, and apparently on the FLI camera, a bug, like a beetle, could enter. It went close to the to the the shutter. It died, and the shutter cut it in pieces. And there was pieces of legs of insects. On the, so this type of thing. Yeah. Of course, shutters also uh, on the FLI cameras and on these big cameras normally do tend to fail after so many uh, thousands of exposures. Uh, in, in our place, uh, I'll just give you a, like a, a drone uh, view. As you see, everything is powered by uh, uh, solar panels. Uh, we have the molds to make uh, clamshells, so we can, uh, you know, use fiberglass and build a clamshell. It takes about 15 days to, to build a clamshell. There are copies of the 12 feet uh, Astro Haven. We have also one big shelter like that, which hosts uh, eight telescopes. And pretty soon we're going to, we're starting, in fact, to build another one like that. Uh, of course, the problem is that, uh, well, the problem, it's a lot better if you have an individual shelter, because if I need to intervene in a telescope, I don't put lights on the others uh, which are working. And as you can see a picture, you, we have a milling machine, a lathe, all the things, you know, it goes from making a small counterweight and adapter place. You always need this type of equipment in a, a remote place, mainly in Chile, because Otherwise, you can send it to be done in uh, Santiago, blah, blah, blah. It takes 10 days, and during 10 days, your telescope doesn't work. Uh, so we have 15 robotic uh, telescopes. And in fact, most of the people have come several times uh, since they have the telescope there. And they visited me. I visited them. Uh, the thing is, uh, for uh, very obvious reasons, I need to go to the, at least to, well, or in the United States, or uh, in Europe, I go to France in order to purchase equipment because in Chile, when you find something which is interesting, it's like twice the price. Uh, and most of the time you don't find what you want. You know, I was looking for what would be called a gaming PC with a, like an i9 uh, computer with a you know, powerful graphics board. And I looked at uh, gaming computer Chile and they were offering like i3. <laughs> And you go like, that's, um, yeah, that's not a gaming piece. So anyway, uh, 
so we we know the people now there are a lot of you know good friends there um uh, talking about software um i i will go a little bit against what what has been said uh, most of the equipment here run under windows uh, there is no spectroscopic telescope um we have had two systems with Linux, and that those are the systems with which we had most problems. Uh, we use, of course, like everybody else, TeamViewer, AnyDesk, and so on. Uh, TeamViewer is a kind of a pain in the ass because if you use it a lot, they tell they decide that you are a professional user. Therefore, you have to pay them so much per month. Uh, AnyDesk does the same thing, but if you reinstall, then it works again for another couple of years. Uh, it's a good practice to have several software. Normally, uh, you know, VNC is a good one. It's quite slow, but it enters on the telescope, on the computer every time. Uh, most of the people are done in uh, fully automated mode, but that fully automated mode only works if the fully manual mode works. I mean, if you cannot focus automatically, if you cannot do an astrometric centering manually and so on and so on, the automatic thing will not work. Uh, most of the ac image acquisition and pre-processing is done, at least I'm talking about the telescopes here, uh, people use either Maxim DL or PRISM. Uh, the automation is done with different suite of software. Uh, personally, I use PRISM because uh, uh, contrarily to what has been, <laughs> has been said, I use PRISM since like 1996. So that's been like 26, 27 years, and it's still working pretty well. Started with version three, and uh, I'm beta testing version 11 right now. Uh, it's all included. I mean, you you observe, you control the telescope, you control everything, uh, and I know the you know, Prism script. So we also use uh, very long uh, scripts in order to automatize the, all the things we want to do. Normally, most people, of course, pre-process locally and only send the, the final images. And in fact, many, you know, many people just send the, the, the raw data that they need, like the magnitude of such variable star or the astrometry and a subframe sub of the asteroid you just discovered and so on and so on. Uh, so you don't need a very, very, very fast internet. But that's one of the reasons sometimes I've had people, why don't you have a telescope for planetary imaging? The problem with planetary imaging, you will make files with you know, gigabytes uh, in order to select the good images and so on and so on. And that's really not adapted for, uh, for remote observing. Uh, talking about money now, it's an important thing. Uh, of course, you have the price of the equipment, but if you use it at your place or in Chile, it will be the same. Uh, shipping, normally the, the heavy stuff goes by air or by boat. Uh, sometimes people send me all the equipment and I have to do all the installation. Sometimes they come with some of the equipment. That means you can bring a camera and your photo bag and so on. And so that, uh, you save a lot on uh, customs and so on. Uh, you have to know that everything declared above $1,000, you need to take a custom agent. And that's, and that's another fact that you, know, you need to know when you send something in Chile, uh, there is no such, uh, there is a way to do a temporary importation, but if you do a temporary importation, you have to give a check on the Chilean bank for the same amount of the money that you declare. So the only way that's practical is, uh, as far as the custom is concerned, is like if I was purchasing your equipment, so legally I'm the owner of your equipment while it is in Chile, and when I send it back, uh, so that's, that has happened twice, Yes, one guy who had bought a very wonderful telescope but didn't know how to use it. And after a while, he, he lost <laughs> patience and I sent everything back. And another guy who wanted to have, he, has, he had two telescopes here. And one of the telescopes went to Tasmania in order to have more like, a, you know, all over the, round, all over the world uh, observation. When you import, you pay uh, Chilean taxes, but normally uh, as a business, I can recover them. So normally, if uh, you send the telescope, you have to tell the company uh, that these Chilean taxes, you don't have to pay them. Uh, if the guy is honest anyway, that's what he will do. Uh, the installation fees depends on the service requested. Sometimes people come with everything. 
and they also come and do the installation. So in this case, I don't cover much for <laughs> for installation since they do everything. Sometimes, uh, well, they send only the mount. I have to build the pillar. Uh, I can also do the counterweights because, of course, sending counterweights is very, you know, very heavy, very expensive, and very stupid. So it's better I, you know, purchase a piece of steel and I make the counterweight here. So in this case, of course, the installation fee can be a little bit more. Uh, the yearly fee, uh, alors in my case, and I, I don't know about the others, in fact, uh, it changes with the electric consumption. If you have the basic system with uh, one PC, a small PC, like a laptop or a NUC, you know, the NUCs are the type of like 12 by 12 centimeter uh, computer. Um, your system runs less than 100 watts, maybe 120 at night when the camera is cooling then that's the basic price. Uh, I've had some people, I have some people who have like very powerful PC that runs like 800 watts. And I almost need one solar installation for the ded dedicated uh, system. So in this case, of course, the price is, is higher uh, because a typical system with batteries, uh, charge controller, uh, solar panel, batteries, solar charge controller, inverter, and all the accessories around it is about $20,000 once once in Chile, and if one guy uses one such installation, I start to earn money five years later, and that's that's not good for me. Uh, so the price depends, but you know the basic system for a typical amateur doing imagery uh, would be about four hundred and something dollars per month. Uh, of course, if you are several people, uh, then the, the you know it runs like hundred bucks for hundred euro is actually hundred bucks right now thanks to Putin. And so it's not very expensive. In fact, if you drive twice per month, 100 miles and come back with the price of the gas, now you spend more money for only two nights. So I think, you know, it's more economical right now to put a telescope in Chile than to have a telescope in a, if you live in a city. Uh, just want to give you some uh, examples. So I don't know if you make, can make a screen copy of the sites. Uh, here are three astrophotographers, and they have uh, made very, very good uh, pictures. Uh, the Rila Officina Stellare, uh, we call it Catastrophicina Stellare. Uh, it's also a beach to collimate. We've never been able to, the software is not made to be able to collimate it, and it's been a very bad relation with these people anyway. Uh, 10 microns are good mounts. Uh, ASA mounts, I like also. Plane wave, plane, plane wave is the tops. Uh, except they have like f6.8, which for CMOS camera is not good, but these telescopes are very easy to collimate. Three screws, the field is flat, everything works, nothing to say, you know. Uh, if you look, in fact, eye telescopes, they have like small refractors, and the other telescopes are all uh, CDKs because they work very well. Uh, Apo, so we have, uh, well, Thomas, is Thomas here? No, no, I, I think, uh, you know, it's not here this night. Yeah, uh, well, he's, he's part of the two-spot group. So they have a 150 millimeter uh, refractor, uh, and they gave me some statistics. So on average, they observe between 160, 190 nights per year. The thing is, you don't use the night when there is full moon. Uh, they've made 9,000 hours of exposure <laughs> since 2014. And apart from very, very nice pictures, you can also make a screen copy for, to get the link. Uh, they have uh, detected 78 planetary nebulae candidates. And of course, that's why Tom uh, is part of the two spot group because they have a lot of them to be confirmed and so on. Uh, we've, uh, I've worked also with a group doing uh, TNO occultations. And so many people, when there is a TNO occultation, I ask the, the people, you know, I tell them, you know, tonight there'll be, well, not tonight, but in three, four nights, there will be such observation to make, can you do it and so on. Uh, and here I just put a kind of funny thing. You see the curve below, although it's, uh, well, increasing magnitude that means fainter like this, okay? So first you see the uh, occultation at around 400, the occultation by Caron, and you see it has no atmosphere. So the, the signal is like very square. And then around 600, you have the occultation by Pluto, which has a kind of atmosphere. I mean, 10 minus six bar is not really atmosphere. On Earth, it's called vacuum, but on Pluto, it's called an atmosphere. 
and you see that the signal goes like progressively in and progressively out and so on. So there's been a lot of publications uh, on the, in many magazines, uh, astronomical magazines, uh, with these uh, results from occultations. Uh, we had uh, uh, works on you know uh, various various science program. The exoplanet around Proxima Centauri was discovered thanks to the help of one telescope here. Um, we've had also some problem. Uh, I'm, I'm giving the example of Eris. We, we made the main observation leading to the measurement, the only measurement we have of the diameter of Eris, which showed that in fact, you know, at first it was announced like between 3000 to 5000 kilometer diameter and so on. And the observation I made here with one of the one of the telescope here uh, showed that it was a little bit smaller than uh, than Pluto, uh, but then I was surprised because all the announcements were talked about the La Silla telescope. I mean, you know, normal that ESO makes publicity for their telescope, and uh, I was quite upset that they said like some other telescopes in Chile, you know, that they were not able to give our name. And so for the Proxima Centauri, I, I told them, you know, if our observatory is not sighted. I will not work for with you anymore. And so they cited us. Sometimes it's kind of hard to be, I would say, respected when you're an amateur astronomer. I'll give you some other example later. We have observed the um, mutual phenomenon of, uh, of uh, the satellites of Jupiter. We have, I have the MAP program, which is a very successful asteroid uh, nearest object and comets uh, program. Uh, we use a uh, synthetic tracking, which is a new technique uh, in a way, which is really much more efficient than the typical technique that all the big observatories are using. Uh, but we've been able to observe 400 nights since 2001, 2021. Um, and really, I mean, for this type of project, if you observe from the north, you will have like a half of the time uh, with clouds and of course, the number of discoveries you'll make is uh, is much less. Uh, I want to finish giving the example of Josh Ham. She's a variable star observer. He uses a one and a half telescope. That means he uses a, a full time 40 centimeter, 40 centimeter telescope, and uh, he uses the bright time. That means when the moon is up, of a Karel Toivon's telescope. Uh, his statistics is that uh, he's been there, he's been here for, since 11 years. The worst year he observed only 311 nights because, of course, in our case, for example, map uh, during the full moon, we just don't observe because the sky is too bright, but he has a lot of, uh, you know, eighth magnitude, tenth magnitude stars. And, you know, with the moon, you don't care. Uh, and the best night, the best year was 345 nights during the year. Uh, he does a lot of pointing, uh, 30 second exposure. And so that's why also he needs a direct drive mount because he can flip like, <laughs> observe like he points, I don't know, 10 degrees per second or more. Uh, in fact, uh, since 2001, it's already the third mount he has uh, because after millions of pointings, uh, the shutter of the camera dies, uh, the, the mounts also start to be in bad shape and so on and so on. But he has produced 6.2 million of, of CCD photometric uh, observations. That means 12% of the, the AAVSO uh, database. He's had a lot of collaboration with professional astronomers. Uh, sometimes some guy is observing some cataclysmic variable with the HST in ultraviolet, and he does the observation in uh, BVR during the night. Um, and uh, he has already published, he is the co-author of at least 118 papers on archive. Uh, he has published a lot of uh, important papers. Uh, one of them was uh, about AR Scorpion. Uh, Proxima Centauri, I mean, it works, you know, really like crazy. One of the nice thing about the AR Scorpion, uh, basically he made it, you know, typical variable star, I think in the, with a period of a few hours, but he, he got a very, very noise, noisy curve and didn't understand what he was looking at. Uh, Reobserved and he had the same noise. Then uh, he talked with some professional he knows and they observed with a 4.2 meter uh, Herschel telescope. And they saw that the star was oscillating in 1.97 minutes. 
uh, then the, 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 that star was observing spectroscopy with the VLT, with Spitzer, with the HSC, and so on. And uh, they all made, uh, you know, a publication. Uh, ESO has observed this new type of variable star, blah, 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 but didn't say that it had been discovered by an amateur astronomer. Uh, the only publication that clearly stated was that Josh Hamsch had been you know, uh, raising that thing uh, was in an article in Sky and Telescope. Uh, the point I want to make is that once you have a telescope in a good site, uh, if it has good maintenance and you provided good equipment and so on, you can really put your astronomy into high gear. And that's really the, you know, what I wanted to, to explain here. Uh, we have more and more light pollution everywhere. In fact, uh, two years ago, I went to observe an eclipse uh, close to La Silla. I had not been, I worked at La Silla for three years. I had not, not been there, but now, now the, 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 the road, which used to be a road, is now like a freeway. They put lights all over the place. So directly from the observatory, you see all these lights. It's very stupid. They're going to put the 25 meter telescope in direct view of like street lights. It's really shocking, okay? Uh, want to, to tell you that indeed uh, sending a telescope is expensive, but if you take every everything into account, if you consider the price of the night, uh, then you know it's clearly a very inexpensive uh, uh, solution uh, compared to putting it, uh, you know, uh, you know, being a traveling astronomer and that type of thing. But anyway, that's roughly what I wanted to explain. Uh, if you have questions, that would be a good moment. I, uh, and then, then there is Alain Klotz still to be. Okay, well, thank you for our attention. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alain. Thank you very much. Um, uh, very, of course, this is very interesting. Uh, we should have had uh, Alain Klotz, but if I'm right, Alain is not on board, uh, except if I miss something. So uh, Alain, if you are around, please tell us, but I doubt. In fact, I, I do have a doubt with the CHK <laughs> name. I, I don't know, I don't know who is it. Anyway, so no, Alain is not there. So what I suggest is, um, uh, if you have questions, this is this is the right moment to ask questions, and we can do that uh, because we, we are not uh, a, a lot of people. So you can ask directly, uh, open your mic, and ask for question if you if you have questions, and uh, maybe uh, I, I I take uh, a few minutes at the end to explain what I remember, what, what I've learned from Alain Klotz. Uh, and, and what, well, which is not a, a summary of his presentation because I, I'm, I'm not able to do it, but to give you a few, uh, few tips uh, about uh, what he said last week. Okay, so do you have, who have questions? Please feel free to ask. I know that the first one is always the more difficult. Well, Alain, Alain I, I, I do have a question for you, but this is really to open the discussion. Uh, you said you say that um, regarding the costs in your last slide, that it is less expensive to, to work uh, remotely than at home. I, I, I don't really understand what, what, what you mean, or maybe I missed something. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, if you have four people and you share a telescope, uh, then the monthly price is about 100 something dollars per person per month, which is much less than what you're going to use if you have to drive 100 miles, put your telescope, observe, come back, and you do that twice per, okay. you know. Uh, in, in the end, it's, it's less expensive to have a telescope in Chile than to have to travel with your telescope. Plus, you're going to have a lot more uh, results than uh, if you observe, uh, if you have to travel. Of course, if you have your telescope in your garden, then okay. of course it's yeah. less expensive. You okay. have much less nights. And also yeah, sure. you have, don't have the southern sky. <laughs> sure, I, I, I do have less nights for sure. There's, uh, there is no doubt. But the, the, for me, it's so, it's so uh, cheap uh, compared to uh, having a remote telescope in Chile. 
uh, that I mean, uh, I could have uh, several telescopes in my backyard uh, and uh, for the same price. But uh, mm -hmm. again, we it, can it, it, it can, yeah, 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 I know. I know this, yeah, this is, um, can be an open discussion. So there are yeah, some, yeah. Uh, I, don't no, but, uh, course, I don't have the South Sky and, and so forth. Yeah, well, so sometimes you have, you have some events that you want to observe and uh, I observed a lot in France and normally that night when you want to observe it's cloudy. <laughs> uh, here sometimes we have like seven, eight weeks of clear weather, night after night after night after night after night, and it's really uh, another game, really. Yeah, yeah, sure. And mm -hmm. that's why I live here, and that's why after working at La Silla, I didn't go back to Paris Observatory. <laughs> okay. Any question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to know, uh, is there a method or a software where I can guide a star directly on the slit? Or do I have to take a star in the vicinity of a slit? Oh, I, can, I can answer if you want. Uh, it depends on the magnitude of your target. Uh, if you have a very bright target, you can auto guide on the target directly into the slit. Uh, because uh, the, the, the star is bigger than the slit, so the auto, -guiding, auto guiding works because uh, he has um, uh, light uh, coming from outside of the slit. So it's. Uh, you, you can do it. But if you have a very, very uh, low magnitude target, so you need uh, to auto guide on a star close to the slit, but not the target. Uh, for example, if you have a target above magnitude 14, uh, you put the target into the slit. And uh, depending of the diameter of your telescope, uh, you just see on a short exposure, you just see the target but it's not very clear uh, it's uh, like the background sky so it's very difficult to have enough light to auto guide on uh, on the target on very low magnitude target but if you have lucky you you can have on the same field auto guiding field you can have uh, another stars brighter than your target so you do auto guiding on the star close to the slit, to your target into the slit. That means with bright stars, uh, the software ignores the slit. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure to, to understand the... With, with no, no, bright but, uh, stars, the software ignores the slit. Um, it sees one star. Yes, in fact, you have enough light outside of the slit to be able to guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One question to the spectroscopic, uh, spectroscopists. Why don't you use a, a field rotator? Uh, yes, it's a good question <laughs> because it cut, uh, it cut, uh, cost uh, money. And uh, yes, you're you're right. Uh, it's better to have uh, uh, the rotator uh, uh, system to orient the slit. Uh, yeah, to orient the slit. Yes, yes. But uh, in our choice, we do mainly um, a punctual target, so it's not uh, really necessary to rotate the slit, uh, depending the orientation of the object. Yeah. Well, if you do a supernova confirmation, it's very good to orient the slit and put the, the center of the galaxy plus the supernova to get two slits and. Yes. Make sure, for example, it's not a Mira star in front of the supernova, in front of the galaxy, and so on. Yes, you're you're right. For supernova, yes, it's better to have uh, both the both the target and the center of the galaxy at the same time in the slit. Yeah. Okay. Nobody has uh, Alan Clot's personal uh, telephone number. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, sh I should have it, but uh, I sent him a um, uh, text too, but uh, I didn't have, didn't have uh, no, no, but call him, call him directly. I don't know what he's doing. Not only on Saturdays, he should be at home. Yeah. Well, anyway, what, what I can tell you, if there is no uh, other uh, other question. Um, oh, Francois? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, would it? 
Uh, we cannot, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I hope a simple question. Has anyone translated the SPEC-NT documentation uh, into one English document? Uh, it's a good question, uh, Woody. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Christian Brill is not very familiar with the English language, so uh, he, he put all information in French. So, yes, I know it's difficult for a non-French uh, speaker to understand what uh, Christian Brill is writing on his website. But I think it's going to do in the next months, uh, because he knows that uh, many uh, 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 amateur astronomers uh, from US or UK need to have uh, uh, an English uh, website uh, for the English documentation, yes. There is some work about it uh, on English translation. Uh, about the documentation. It, it, it has been started with a um, other person, but I don't know where is uh, this work. But uh, in my information, it is started, um, I think. Thank you. And, and a follow-up question, if I may. How does spec Inti and Demetra and Isis fit together as we go forward? Um, uh, on... on the, the process or the result, the question is about, uh, is it the same thing on all the same? Um, it is uh, approximately the same work on each application or the result or all the process? Well, the, the, the question again is, Demetra is a developing product. I have been using ISIS for many years and Spec Entity comes now to us and I think they all do approximately the same thing. Yes. And going forward, are we moving in one of those directions or another, or is it a personal preference? Uh, uh, we perhaps could uh, uh, add some information, but I think um, today is uh, is not contains not all the 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 the, 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 the application all the function uh, like ISIS, but the, the, the goal of SPECINT is to take some session and execute it without intervention. The, the first okay. goal of the application was, was it. Um, there is a lot of function of ISIS, the base of ISIS has been taken uh, and uh, put in SPECINT, but in Python. The, one of the goal is to make this in Python and for um, for uh, the StarX, you know, uh, the, the project uh, associated with the SolX. So the, the first goal was hit. And I think Christian will add some functions in the time. But um, today, we, you, you haven't all the function of ISIS in SpecNT. There is a lot of things uh, of, in the core, but uh, not all. Uh, again, ISIS is more powerful, I think, um, uh, with a lot of functions. But okay. Christian will be uh, more performant for for response about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I can add something. Uh, you know, the, the software question is always something complex. Uh, of course, the, the software evolves uh, over the time, and um, and and what Christian Build uh, did with the spec in T, I think, he is <laughs> once again. It is uh, writing uh, what will be in the future. So probably at the moment, uh, the, the, the spec in T is not mature enough, uh, not enough translated, not um, the, as Mathieu said, there, there, there are some missing functions, but uh, really the, 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 the fact that we are going towards a, a Python script and a process uh, with the different steps uh, written in Python I think uh, this really uh, opens the, the, the door to the future, you know. So now we, we cannot compare. So Demetra is a, a, a Windows software uh, dedicated to people working close to the instrument and we manage from the acquisition to the data reduction. So the approach is not the same, but you're right. At some, so, so there is a part of the software that are doing exactly the same thing. And, and of course, we, we have a question, but you know, this changes uh, 
with the time, with the technology, uh, with the new tool that we have. And, and for me, clearly, the, the Python solution is, is the good direction uh, to follow. But it's probably too early at the moment to start with speaking T for uh, uh, most of us because it is still, uh, it doesn't have the maturity yet. But, uh, but you know, you know, Christian, it will have the maturity. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Yes, David, yes. Yo. Yes, yes, sorry, I just had to turn my microphone on. Um, <clears throat> speaking, is that a, got a user interface of, of some sort or is it completely command line driven? Uh, uh, if I could answer the question, if is it easy to work with it with a guy, uh, a graphic usage, or yeah, only yeah. with core? Yes, there is a two way. You, you have uh, the first version was the core, um, uh, the, uh, very, uh, um, uh, very like you, you know, uh, a script, a Python script. You put the args in the launch of the terminal and and go. It, it, it makes the jobs, um, and the core has been thinking to to accept guy uh, over this core and. Um, uh, Valerie uh, create a guy and you can uh, download only the the guy you know in the core in, inside and you use it you you, you can watch the the, um, the setup conf file configuration uh, you can watch your observation file for our uh, easy management of these files and write it more easily uh, to don't have to uh, prepare a script to prepare files uh, with information and after that you can click a button and launch and it do the jobs and you can watch uh, your spectrum you can well, you can create your response your instrumental response uh, on it with the database uh, like easy um, uh, for example and um, and you you can manage your ses your session uh, un um, entirely uh, with uh, spec in t if you have prepare your observation file and your uh, configuration file. For example, um, I use SpecNT more often with the Starrex, but I, I, I make a session with my LP and I just uh, I use uh, in uh, several times um, Demetro or Isis, but I create my file observation and my um, setup configuration and I process the same session with SpecNT. So just for, for watch um, differences and one another approach I've been had it in SpecNT it is the the calibration calibrations um, during the sessions you you take your objects um, your spectrum of your objects and in the same time you have the calibration lamp it is on during the object um, acquisition and SpecNT process it. Um, I think like professional uses this, this, um, these techniques and you extract the calibration lines on your spectrum, but you don't have to make another calibration files, for example, um, adds to your object files, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, SpecNT can do this and um, it is very interesting to to have this, um, this other web, for example, I, th I think, um, I, I know um, Olivier uh, use PackinT uh, for the Halpi, but for example, two spot uh, have the Halpi and we process all the um, all the, the files with PackinT. So you can use it with a core for sure, but you have uh, so the guy and you can process your file with the guy and it's quite easy, I think, uh, for, for process. The, 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 one of the principal goal of this application, application for Christian is to, um, to, to make some people who doesn't make spectro, spectroscopy before come to spectroscopy and try it and, uh, and play with it. And just, uh, uh, the, it is a, the, um, the principle of the Solex projects, Solex and Starex, it is a, start uh, with your little budgets and a little cost and uh, and start with az software also and this is the the, the principle of uh, of all of this uh, i don't know if i ask i answer to the response yeah now speaking to you is all written in python is it so, so it'll run on any platform that runs python that's uh, correct i don't really understand sorry oh. Because SpecNT is written in Python, yes, it'll also run on other 
uh, yes, operating like system. Mac OS platform, for example. Yes, yeah, for the, the, the source code is not online. It is not open source, but um, we have compiled uh, version for for a lot of operating system like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and Raspberry Pi. Um, the 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 goal is also that for yes, it is to execute the software on whole computer you want because we, we know there is a lot of uh, people on Windows, but there is also a lot of people on macOS, and and a Raspberry Pi is a good way to um, uh, extract or process your files at the the next close to to the telescope. So we try to to create a lot of version for operating system, and Python is is a good way to to do this. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. I see the I'm seeing the question from Keith uh, regarding the, the UVX full remote capability. So to give you a, a very quick update, uh, we have we, we are in the in the final run for this uh, this product. So I hope it will be available uh, in, in in few weeks uh, from now. So we, we are entering in the uh, in the vacation season. So uh, it will probably take take you. Uh, say one, one two months uh, to to really finish, um, I, and and in fact uh, we will make some announcements and we have some great features and uh, and uh, we, we we thought about the all the people that already have a UVEX uh, to be sure that uh, uh, they, they, they will uh, reach the uh, the best performance uh, that we can and and so on so. As I told you, I'm working. I, I'm lucky uh, enough to have the uh, one prototype on my uh, system, and I'm, I'm I'm working to do some observation to to prepare the documentation and so on. So we are really in the in the final uh, final uh, line. I see also the, the, the question from John. Uh, do you get the same results uh, with the processing spectra in spec in T, ISIS, and Demetra? Or are there uh, differences that show up? <laughs> um, uh, I would say that, well, uh, I can let other uh, reply, but I, I would say that, uh, generally speaking, uh, the algorithm uh, behind are the same. And most of them are, have been written by Christian Bill. And uh, well, not not all not all of them, but um, uh, uh, well, generally speaking, we can really compare the result. And and uh, I know that from time to time, I've done the, the job to take the same data set and, and process with the different software, and we we really get the, the same result. And uh, but really, this is because behind the logical is the same. So. Uh, we consider that we have different steps uh, in the data processing, and for each step, we have some algorithm. So when I'm talking about steps, and we are talking about the master images, we are talking about uh, uh, the pre-processing, we are talking about uh, geometry uh, corrections, and, and uh, a spectrum extraction, and so on. And we all have the same idea. And in fact, what, what we are starting to see uh, with the SpecNT is to see uh, the, the same approach, but with Python uh, steps and, and Python uh, algorithms. So this is again the, the, the now the, the software are not all the same. Again, in Demetra we have we do have the acquisition. In Demetra we are managing the wool the, the observation uh, as as a single object, and and we are not talking about different files that you have to remember that you have taken this dark. Uh, for this image and so on. So in the metro, we manage that. So we, we, we try to have something which is very uh, easy to use in the field. Uh, but again, uh, it is to be used in the field in real time, uh, close to the telescope. Uh, if you want to do some, some remote processing or some, if you want to, to have some batch processing, you cannot do it uh, with the metro. Okay, so the, the application are the same, but now the, 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 the principle, the data reduction process uh, that is behind is very comparable. You know, so I know in Demetra we have an automatic uh, uh, calibration algorithm, 
uh, which works uh, fine. But well, generally speaking, the, the, the most complex uh, step in any case is the wavelength calibration. So in, in this area, we still have to, to, to work and there is still some room for improvement. But in, in all, all other steps are mainly the same. Yeah. If you want to have something, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the result is very close, but I'm not an expert, you know, I just stopped spectroscopy three years ago. But uh, if I remember, Olivia, just in little difference, uh, I think it was about the noise, the difference with Pekin T and Isis, Olivier. Uh, I think you have just seen some noise differences. Yes, you're right. Uh, depending, the because in Pekin T, you have many, uh, uh, many uh, function to reduce the uh, same spectra a different manner. So you have, for example, you have five different uh, calibration mode for in spec in T. And one of these modes uh, consists to, to like uh, Mathieu said, uh, to have a line uh, present in the your target spectrum. So, for example, if you take with an LP600 a long time exposure on very fine target, let's say more than 600 seconds, you will see uh, a line uh, in the middle of the spectrum. This is the oxygen uh, one line at 5577.35 uh, angstrom. And this line is always at the same time because it's an atmospheric line. So we use uh, SpecInT use this line to just uh, shift all row spectrum before addition to move all the row spectrum with this line. So uh, we have better uh, accuracy above the resolution, in fact, because maybe when you take long time exposure about more than two hours, for example, you have some shift during the first exposure to from the last exposure. So spec in T, in fact, uh, move each individual spectra before additional, uh, make an addition, addition. of all, uh, all spectra. And another uh, difference also, it's uh, we have many manner, many different uh, uh, manage to to uh, apply uh, the flat spectrum uh, in spec in T uh, in uh, this for example you apply the flat for each individual uh, row uh, spectra in spec in T you can but it's not uh, always the case you have the choice uh, to apply the flat field on the uh, the spectrum uh, the uh, not the individual spectrum, but the result of the addition spectrum. So you have, in fact, for very fine target, you have less noise uh, in this case. So, in fact, uh, SpecInT have many more uh, options to reduce uh, spectrum depending your target. If it's a bright target or low target, high resolution target, low resolution target. So uh, you have many tips to process a spectrum in a spec in T. And I can add uh, that, that, that's, that's a good point. And uh, for sure, well, I, I, I did talk about the principle, the general principle, uh, and, and most of the algorithms are the same. But uh, you're right, Olivier. Uh, in fact, in, in spec in T, uh, Christian did add some new uh, algorithm to a few, to few steps uh, that improves uh, the result. And, and, and this is also something which is very important. If, if we are able to split uh, the, the data reduction process in uh, clear steps and uh, independent steps, uh, which is not the case yet uh, for, in, for speaking T, but I'm, I'm sure it will be uh, in, in the near close future, uh, then we can really work on each step and each algorithm for each step to improve the general process. And uh, so the, the, this is really, this is really uh, the idea. At the moment, we we have Christian, which is uh, something to, totally new. Uh, so we, we know that he's a pioneer and he's really inventing the the. the the, the new world, but the, the, the idea is uh, we, we have to work all together to be able to, to participate, to all participate, to, to improve uh, the, the, the real solution. 
on another tip for uh, with uh, our experience with the two spot uh, uh, the two spot in remote operation we have constant uh, more than one year in uh, remote operation in chile that the in a, a night in chile is very stable in temperature so the difference temperature from the beginning to the end of the night it's about let's say five degree maximum and sometimes it's less it's just one or two degrees from the beginning to the end of the night so uh, with the lp600 this spectrograph is very stable in fact so the calibration uh, uh, equation we use in fact the same calibration equation from night to night so uh, we have only one equation and we apply this uh, polynomial equation from every night and just shift the spectrum with um, an atmospheric line present in uh, our target image. That's all, and it worked fine. Yes, David? Um, a little bit off topic. Um, I've got a LHRS3, and it has a small what you call a domain. So if you want to take a spectrum of uh, one part or, of a star, and then you want to move and take another part, do you know if there's any way I can automate um, changing the micrometer screw to get to another, to different parts of the spectra? Mm -hmm. uh, the, well, this is a question that we have from time to time. The, we, we don't have any, uh, automatic system. I, I know that uh, few people uh, did design a, a motor system uh, for changing the wavelengths uh, of the virus free, uh, but we, we don't have, uh, well, we, we don't have a, such a device, uh, a standard device uh, from Shadiac. And okay. well, the, the, the main reason is that we have few persons who has this question, but uh, really not enough to 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 make something uh, quite efficient uh, at the end. And uh, um, I also think that, uh, well, generally speaking, changing the wavelengths during the night is probably not a good idea because you have to redo all your calibration images and so on. So it's a complex situation, and the idea is more to use to select the way, the, the wavelengths you want to observe. And most of time, this is a, around H alpha, but so it, it can be another line, of course. Uh, and, and then stay uh, with this configuration and observe all night long. But I'm, I'm saying that, and I told you that I'm working currently working on the UVEX uh, motor module, and uh, I, and I discover how it is uh, great and it is powerful to be able to change the wavelength. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Maybe yeah I understand. Um, just the L S three has a very narrow uh, yep. band of wavelength. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's true. Uh, yes, but uh, the, the the good point is that uh, this is a high resolution, so you can see a lot of details uh, in the lines that you are observing. But of course, the, 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 this is the, the trade off. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I believe you'll have to record the Alain Claude's conference uh, later when he wakes up. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and then uh, you will add it to the, ah, maybe. To the main ah, video. We can, we can do that to the to the uh, yeah, the yes, yeah, because it would be nice to, to hear what he has to say. Yeah, well, um, Oh, and maybe we 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 we'll do that. Maybe we ask uh, we ask uh, Alan if he if he can uh, record or something, record something, and and maybe we can add it uh, to the replay. Uh, for me, um, Alan Alan is uh, is an important guy, and he has a lot of experience with his uh, uh, observatories and, and all the the two, uh, program. Uh, which is not a spectroscopic uh, observation. This is imaging uh, observation. So this is mainly for photometry. Uh, but uh, all what he says is uh, to me very important. So for him, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what he told us uh, last time, last week, that uh, 
his experience uh, shows that uh, you need at least one year uh, to make your installation work for one year before you can ship it uh, far away to be sure that all can work uh, together. He says also that uh, while it takes time, it takes uh, usually uh, uh, you have to, to count on four years uh, before your system is mature. Yeah, and, and before that, you will face uh, problems and, and uh, uh, reliability uh, issues and so on. So it takes time to have something which is really uh, operational and, and productive. And for me also, there is, so I, I told you that uh, at the beginning of my presentation that uh, this is Alain Klotz who, who told me that uh, when you are doing robotic observation, uh, the telescope and the instrument is not the big deal. The, the big deal is the, the quantity of data that you have processed, you have to have process in real time, because if you don't do it in real time, you'll, you'll accumulate data very, very quickly and, and you cannot manage that. So it has to be fully automated from, from the beginning to the end. And this is really uh, one of the key. And also something I learned uh, from uh, uh, Alain is that uh, we need to have uh, some reliability and the reliability is uh, most of the time based on the simplicity. So you have to have simple bricks. Uh, every bricks, uh, every brick in your system must be must be uh, easy to understand, and uh, and and you 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 have to separate functions. Don't hesitate to put one PC per function, and and make the PC uh, communicate together. Because if you have a problem, you'll be able to detect very quickly what is the problem. And this is really something which is uh, important. This this modularity. The fact that you are splitting the, the system in, in different ways, but well, th these are things like that. For and, and really, uh, his experience is is uh, very important uh, for me. But you are right, uh, Alain will will ask. Uh, well, the other Alain <laughs> will ask Alain Claude if it's possible to uh, to record something and and to add it on the uh, on the video. Okay. If there is no more questions, maybe we can stop here. Um, um, one, more, one more question. Um, yes. Spec Inti, is that available now for anyone or and where from? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, okay, Mathieu. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you can, you can, you can talk. Okay, um, Spec Inti is available on the Christian Brill website. Uh, I don't know exactly the address, but uh, if you uh, type in Google uh, Spec Inti Christian Brill Solex, for example, you will uh, have the website address on, uh, and you will find it. Thank you. I, I know where the website is. I post it in, I, in the chat. I could add that I have it running on an M1 MacBook Pro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, no, no for, uh, yes and yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Uh, if you want to run it on the, proce the processor M1, no, it will not work, but you it, can. It's working. But you, <laughs> yes, but you can work it with uh, Rosetta 2. Uh, I haven't made. Um, uh, I don't remember, perhaps. Uh, I know it is uh, in the to-do list, but uh, you can run it uh, in the Rosetta 2 in Mac M1, uh, for sure. Uh, I tried it. Uh, but I don't create a version specific, a specific version for M1 with uh, this processor. But I will probably do it uh, because I want to run it uh, also on my M1. <laughs> Um, after David's question, I think it was a second last, I asked myself if it's a good idea to have a 600 line grating with a L Hyrus 3, or is it able to make an overall sharp picture? Well, the, the one of the uh, one of the advantage of the lowest tree is that you can change the grating. And of course, if you change the grating, you, you change the resolution and the, the covered bandwidth. 
So of course, if you put a, a 600 line per millimeter grating instead of the 2,400 uh, lines that is in standard, of course, you will extend uh, the, the, the bandwidth. But you, you, there is something that uh, you, you have to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, the, the large tree is, has a little architecture. Little architecture means that we have the same lens uh, used two times, one time as a collimator and the, the second time as the objective lens. And this lens is an achromatic doublet. So this is a quite basic uh, lens. And uh, because it is a basic lens, it, it is not really able to correct uh, the, um, the uh, chromatism in the system. So when you are working at high resolution, which is the, the basic uh, mode for the Laris tree. So in this case, we, we don't really care about the chromatism because, because the bandwidth, the chromatic bandwidth is, is very small. But as, as soon as you extend this, this bandwidth, uh, the, the, the quality of the image uh, will, will be, uh, the, the, the quality will be lower, you know? So it will work. You can really in, in, um, increase the bandwidth, but uh, always keep in mind that the, the, the quality, the best quality for the RS3 is really reached with the high resolution grating. Mm -hmm. So the standard grating, which is the 2,400 lines. Mm -hmm. and um, I make sure? Yes, uh, with 600 lines, uh, the quality in the outer parts will be less. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. But less, uh, it works. It works. So you, you yeah. it's it's really an option. It's a clear option. Okay. But, Thank you. You know, for, for sure. It, well, I, I can I can tell you that in other way. Uh, if we would design uh, the Laris suite today, we would design it uh, another way. In fact, uh, we we will have a much better uh, optics. Uh, to manage uh, this kind of issue. Okay, but again, the, this instrument is optimized and it is still optimal uh, for the high resolution. Thank you. That's it. Question? No more question? <laughs> That's it, okay. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank yes. you to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and uh, talk to you soon. And, and again, thank you for your attendance. And, uh, and that's, that's great to be with you tonight. Okay. Bye. Good night to all. Bye.